to our Wintrum class on Ezra Nehemiah, and uh, let's once again invoke the, the Holy Spirit, the ultimate author of, uh, of the text, to uh, direct us as we look at the text this morning. So let's pray together. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this day and conscious again, particularly as we interact with uh, your revelation given in the biblical text, that you are the sovereign God. You control all that uh, takes place in your creation. Father, we uh, thank you for the reminder that from the greatest to the least uh, of men in the world, uh, Father, you are, you are involved in directing their activities. Father, it, uh, it amazes us that you are able to stir the spirit and change the heart of a human king, uh, to do your will in accordance with your word. Truly, you are a great and awesome God. God also is able to stir the spirit of your people uh, to respond to your work in the world, and particularly uh, to respond to your word that you have given to us. And we thank you for the crescendo that we will see in this biblical text of how your people respond in faith and obedience uh, to the word that uh, you have given to them, and Father also given to us. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, we, as we come to your word by your spirit, might uh, be once again enthralled and uh, awed by your majesty, by your awesome being, uh, by your sovereignty, by your power, and uh, by the ability that you have to accomplish your will in the world. And Father, we thank you to also accomplish your will in our lives. We believe your will today is that uh, we might come to understand better you through the revelation you have given in your word. And so, Father, we implore that the same spirit who directed the human author to pen these words. Father, we thank you that through faith in Jesus Christ, we know that same Holy Spirit and dwells us and illumines our minds to be able to understand the truth that is in Scripture. And we pray for that illuminating ministry by your Holy Spirit uh, today. Father, I pray that uh, you would guide, uh, guard and guide uh, both uh, my words and, and the thoughts and the words of, of the students and all those that uh, might be watching uh, this today. Uh, Father, I pray that this uh, might be uh, a time when we sense your spirit is again teaching us from your word. And Father, we pray that again it might not be just a mere academic exercise, but by your spirit you might be transforming us into conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. We pray that in all things that he might receive the honor and the glory. And Father, we do pray that... Uh, uh, that each one of us uh, might be used by your Holy Spirit to, uh, to show forth Christ to this generation as uh, we learn and apply your word personally to our lives. So, Father, I pray that you might teach us, that you might transform us by your Spirit, that uh, we might be fit representatives of Christ and be his spokesman in this generation. That is our desire, that is our prayer. And we ask that you would grant it even as you guide us through your spirit in this class time today. And we ask this in the honor and glory of your name in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Through, uh, through his mediation, we pray. Amen. Well, as I shared with you just before class began, um, I uh, 
realize that first and foremost, uh, we are in this classroom and we are interacting together as a professor and students on the biblical text. And uh, for the next four plus hours, you will be my focus. But uh, after the class was over, I was made aware again that uh, this is being uh, transmitted live stream, that uh, there are people that are watching. Uh, even as we are interacting with the scripture in this class. And, um, and certainly I received both commendations and, uh, and, and a couple of uh, confrontations on uh, what I shared yesterday, particularly at the, uh, the end of the class. And we're going to, as we get into text this morning, take a look at a couple of inclusios that uh, we'll begin our discussion of the first six chapters of Ezra. And so I'm going to kind of do an inclusio as far as uh, the, the lecture is concerned, uh, uh, reiterating, hopefully, what I said yesterday and why I said uh, what I said as far as uh, you know, Christ in the Old Testament. And, uh, and at the very end, I'm going to expose the last uh, few verses of Ezra chapter 6, and, uh, and I will show you how I would, as a Christian preacher, uh, in, invoke uh, what is in Scripture as a reminder of how we can look at Scripture too and, uh, and see Christ. Though I'm not going to say that uh, Christ is specifically in the, uh, the passage that, uh, that I will look at. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, I, I, I was kind of uh, chastised for not seeing uh, types of Christ in Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, significantly, ETS last uh, November in San Diego, uh, the theme was Christ in Scripture. And uh, a number of the seminars I went to uh, we talked about the, in, in our interactions that there is, to a certain extent, not an agreed-upon definition of typology. Uh, so when I'm saying uh, things are types or not types, uh, uh, we have to recognize that uh, typology is one of those terms which is, um, uh, you know, open to... Uh, open to discussion and basically what is a good definition of uh, what makes something a, a type. And uh, you should know that even our hermeneutical textbooks uh, do not consistently agree on what is and what isn't, you know, a type it can be given that official uh, label, if I can say it that way. It is significant, as I said, that the first winterum 30 years ago was uh, S. Lewis Johnson, and the subject, based upon a little book that uh, he had uh, penned previous to him coming to TMS, was uh, the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So it's interesting that uh, uh, even 30 years ago, this was a, a topic of uh, how do we understand and interpret the Old Testament in light of its use in the New Testament. And I would say that uh, if anything in the last 30 years, that discussion has only intensified. And I would say at this point, there's even less agreement um, among evangelical uh, scholars than there was even 30 years ago. Now, it's significant because, as I told you, Dr. Johnson was my Greek instructor and actually was the one who introduced me to the whole concept of biblical typology in uh, our exegesis class at, uh, at Dallas Seminary. And thank you, a couple of you said that my Dallas roots do come out. Uh, and, uh, and I would say my old Dallas roots come out. And yes, I am heir of, of S. Lewis Johnson and Dwight Pentecost and John Walvard uh, and, uh, and others. Not that I necessarily agree with every last thing I was taught, but certainly they provoked me to think in certain ways, and, and even if I disagree with them, they have good reasons on uh, why I would 
see things differently than, uh, than I was, uh, was taught. So I am a product of, I guess, what you might call middle Dallas. There's old Dallas, which was the days of Chafer, and kind of uh, moderate Dallas or middle Dallas, somewhat known as moderate dispensational Dallas, uh, the days of Walver, Pentecost, uh, Ryrie, etc. And of course, now you have kind of new Dallas, the more progressive dispensationalism that, uh, that uh, marks the school uh, today. And, uh, and yeah, I, I would say that uh, my heirs are Johnson, you know, Toussaint, Pentecost, etc. And uh, uh, that was my education. Uh, and, and in the providence of God, the good hand of God, it was a Dr. Johnson who taught me that a type is an Old Testament individual place or event that in some way was seen in the New Testament as prefiguring either the person or work of Jesus Christ. That there is correspondence, there is analogy. And uh, the debate, of course, is with, with type, it has to in some way be acknowledged in the, uh, the New Testament. Uh, probably a case in point, is Joseph a type of Christ? Well, the MacArthur Study Bible, Dr. MacArthur says very definitely yes. Uh, but the debate, of course, is that the New Testament nowhere sees Joseph as prefiguring Christ. Now, was Joseph a savior of his people? And the answer is yes. All right. So in that way, did he prefigure, anticipate uh, Christ? Uh, well, yes. And, um, and yet is there a New Testament warrant for that? And the answer would be, well, no. Uh, so I have no problem saying that uh, in the Old Testament we see very definite patterns. We're going to see this in the first six chapters of Ezra, that uh, the narrator is going to be directed by the Holy Spirit to show us echoes of, of Israel's coming out of Egypt and entering the promised land and ultimately building uh, the, uh, the temple, uh, the place where the presence of God would uh, be known, the name of God would reside. Uh, that is, we think in terms of what is in the, the Torah and the former prophets, that uh, certainly an, uh, Annas, uh, is antecedent to Ezra and Nehemiah, both historically and canonically, that as you're reading and have that background, you realize, okay, there are echoes of what God did in the past, uh, the, the distant past, then reverberating in the way the narrator shares what God did in the recent past, that is uh, three or four generations previous to his writing, with uh, the return, particularly uh, under uh, Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua, on the basis of the uh, decree that was issued by Cyrus. And so are there analogies between what happened in Zerubbabel's day and what happened in Moses' day? What happened in Zerubbabel's day and Solomon's day? And the answer is going to be, yes, there are analogies. And of course, the Old Testament writer was, was conscious of that, that uh, those parallels, those analogies uh, existed which is foundational then to New Testament writers being able to look back at the Old Testament and uh, seeing these uh, prefigurations, these, these narrative patterns uh, that are seen in the Old Testament that, uh, that anticipated the person and work of Christ. And uh, when they do point them out, whether they use the word type or not, obviously Romans 5 talks about Adam as a type of Christ, in the sense that Adam made a decision which impacted humanity. The same thing, Jesus' decision, impact, uh, to, uh, to come and, uh, and be the second Adam, the last Adam, to, uh, uh, to die for those who sinned and uh, were associated with Adam's sin. Uh, so that just as Adam had impact, Christ has impact. 
upon uh, upon others. And, and so Adam is a type, and of course Christ is the antitype. You can have a passage like Matthew chapter 2, that in the Old Testament, just as, as God called Israel his son, his firstborn son, out of Egypt at the, uh, the Exodus, Hosea 11.1, 1, that prefigured what he did with Christ, his, uh, his son and uh, call him out of Egypt. So there's a, there's a pattern that was seen in the Old Testament, the scene in the New, and when the New, says, when the new brings it up in that way, I, I think we can use that official word type. Now, I, as I brought up yesterday, am fairly conservative. Without the New Testament warrant either directly or indirectly, I would rather use the term analogy rather than type. So do I see analogies uh, concerning Christ and Ezra and Nehemiah? My answer would be yes. Would I like to use the term type? No. Basically because Ezra and Nehemiah is never directly quoted and hard-pressed to see even an allusion to Ezra and Nehemiah in the New Testament. It's on that foundation that I say I don't think we have New Testament warrant for saying that we can find types of Christ in Ezra and Nehemiah. I realize I'm very conservative. I err on the side of, uh, of caution. Uh, and uh, I just want to be careful. I want to be careful both at the interpretive stage and also, most importantly, the homiletic stage, because so many of our listeners get their interpretive grid from our preaching. And uh, it's very, very hard at times for the person in the pew to make the distinction between what is hermeneutical and what is homiletical. Uh, and that's what I was saying yesterday. I'm not sure that I, uh, even after all my years of preaching, uh, make that uh, clear distinction because by the time I'm preaching, I'm communicating what I've learned, uh, you know, to an audience, a New Testament audience, and don't make at times a fine line between, you know, what is in the text and what is an implication of that text for a New Testament uh, listener, a New Testament uh, 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 believer who is listening to the, uh, the message. And that's what makes preaching Old Testament, and particularly Old Testament narrative, you know, very, very difficult. And uh, because it's difficult doesn't mean it should never be done. But it should be done very, very carefully. And, uh, and obviously we're going to get into a narrative now and uh, try to be careful as we go through interpreting it. And uh, as I said at the very end, of this morning, I'll give you, for about the last 20 to 25 minutes of class, I'll give you an exposition based upon, you know, my interpretation of uh, the, uh, the text in uh, Ezra chapter 6. So that's the inclusio. I talk a little bit then about the, the principles uh, uh, guiding our, our uh, interpretation and our proclamation of uh, Old Testament text. And at the end, inclusio, I'll give you an example of how I would do it, putting the principles, as it were, into practice. And talking about inclusio, that is where you come at the end and, and uh, refer back to something that you introduced at the beginning. Now open your Bibles, and let's turn to Ezra chapter 1. As uh, we said yesterday, it is universally agreed that the first six chapters of Ezra make up the first narrative block of this, of this text. And uh, we definitely have inclusion, all right, that uh, as we begin in, in Ezra 1.1, we saw yesterday the first... Uh, subject of the main clause is Yahweh, and the verb stirred. Yahweh stirred the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. 
So the action of Cyrus issuing this proclamation, and there was a decree, a memorandum of understanding that uh, was foundational then to a proclamation that was written out to be used by the proclaimers who would go throughout the Persian Empire, go to the main centers, the town centers of uh, the major cities throughout the, uh, the Persian Empire, and they would give this proclamation uh, based upon the decree, the memorandum of understanding that had been issued by Cyrus. And that memorandum of understanding that is foundation to the proclamation is, is found when we get to Ezra chapter 6. That's what's found. The, as it were, the original memorandum, the original decree in writing was found. What we have in chapter 1 is, again, the oral proclamation based upon that written uh, decree, that written memorandum of understanding. And so that the proclaimers would would get it right, the proclamation also was put in writing. In other words, the proclaimer didn't, you know, didn't get up extemporaneously and say, well, I, I've read a decree and let me, let me proclaim to you what, it you know, what it says and its implications for you. That was written out too. Uh, it's kind of like you're a preacher and uh, to make sure you get it right, uh, you know, a seminary faculty, you know, give you, here's your message, and you're to give it word by word, but, you know, word for word, uh, to make sure you get it right, get it accurate. Aren't you glad we don't look over your shoulder uh, that precisely when, uh, when you preach? We, we anticipate you've learned the biblical text well enough that, uh, that, that the Spirit of God will guide you uh, as you uh, proclaim it. But... Uh, but it was a written proclamation based upon a written decree, a written down decree. But it is significant that, okay, that proclamation which was delivered based upon that decree began by Yahweh's work in the spirit internally in Cyrus. Again, there's no evidence that Cyrus was a believer in Yahweh, that he had a personal relationship with Yahweh, but Yahweh still was able to stir his spirit. As Proverbs 21.1 says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, uh, that he uh, directs their, their thinking, he directs their spirit. Now, significantly, stirring the spirit is in the first verse of chapter 1. Now turn over to Ezra chapter 6, verse 22, and see how this narrative ends. It ends in verse 22, and they observed the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for Yahweh had caused them to rejoice and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So it's interesting, 1.1 one, one speaks about how God worked internally in the king, inclusio at the very end, how Yahweh worked internally in the king, stirring up the spirit, turning the heart. Right? Spirit and heart are both dealing, obviously, with the immaterial aspect of the king. Now, when we get there, uh, I believe that the king being mentioned in chapter 6 is Darius, not Cyrus, because it was a further decree of Darius that uh, led to the completion of the temple and uh, the, the, the circumstance and the joy. But, of course, he based his further decree on the original decree that he found from Cyrus. And significantly, too, he calls them to rejoice, that is, his people, along with the king. Go back to chapter 1, see how this inclusio works. Not only in chapter 1, verse 1, did the Lord stir the spirit of Cyrus to issue the proclamation, but notice verse 5, those who responded to the proclamation 
also responded because their hearts were stirred. Their spirits were stirred. And so verse 5 of Ezra 1, Then the heads of the fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God has stirred up to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord or the house of Yahweh, which is in Jerusalem. So the same God who stirred the spirit of Cyrus to issue the proclamation is the same Yahweh who stirred the spirit of those Israelites who responded to that proclamation to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So God was working in the heart both of the king and the people. You get to the end of uh, the narrative section, chapter 6, verse 22, and a reminder, God had worked in the heart of the king, and he's also worked in the heart of the people. All right, so you can see, obviously, a beginning and ending. Of this inclusio makes it very clear. Okay, here is our narrative unit to look at. This, uh, I mean, how could the author have done any better to say, all right, what began in chapter 1 is concluded in chapter 6, at least partially. <laughs> There's more to take place at the temple, uh, and he's going to hint at that at chapter 6. And, of course, the book doesn't end in chapter 6. It continues on because you can't just have a building. You have to have what God wants done at that building done, and the people taught and that and the and the, uh, the uh, people who will minister there on God's behalf, uh, protected, secured, etc. And uh, so there is, there is more to, you know, God's uh, fulfilling his work that he wanted to, to, to have done at the temple. And uh, obviously the final dedication and uh, the final display, as it were, of the temple now fully functioning in the way that God designed based upon the, uh, the previous uh, uh, dictates of David and Solomon to have, as it were, the second temple completely working in the way that God had established for the first temple, that doesn't all conclude until Nehemiah chapter 12. That's, that's, why the, <clears throat> that's obviously why the book uh, continues on. So you have, that, uh, you have that inclusio, and then, of course, you have the proclamation based upon the decree. And we'll come back and look a little bit more at, uh, at uh, the decree, but even see that, the decree to go back and build the house in chapter 1. Now go back again to chapter 6, and there's a secondary inclusio, that when the temple was completed, when the house was built, 614, and the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Ido, and they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Same term. Now, the decree of God and the decree of the Persian kings. Okay, the temple was completed because both the divine king and the human kings had determined by decree that it was going to happen. Of course, this is correspondence. Okay, it was the was the temple built because of the decree of God, the determination of God? The answer is yes. Was it also by the decree, the determination of human kings? And the answer is yes. All right, that there is, a, there is a correlation between the two. The, the human decree equals the divine decree. By the way, this is, this is important because in Ezra Nehemiah, this is the way God is communicating his will. One of the ways is communicating his will to his people through the decrees of the human king. And uh, there are three major decrees, obviously, Cyrus and uh, Darius, and then uh, the decree of, uh, 
of Artaxerxes that will be recorded in Ezra chapter 7 that we'll look at tomorrow, that, uh, <coughs> that uh, assumed, based upon chapter 4, with a secondary decree that will be issued in Nehemiah chapter 2. But that's all tomorrow. So the decree is the way in which the determination of God is being made known to Israel. When Cyrus says, Yahweh has, has appointed me, and this is what he's commanded me to say to you, right? that is you know, God's words. It's going to be significant when we get to chapter 7. Ezra is going to be commanded by Artaxerxes to teach people both the law of God and the law of the king. He didn't see any distinction between the two. In other words, if, if, if they obey the law of God, they'll obey the law of the king. And obviously, hopefully obeying the law of the king, they'll, they'll see how the law of the king in some way dovetails with the law of, of God. By the way, and by application today, uh, we can see, it, again, the analogy of uh, human decrees equaling divine decrees. To a certain extent, that's what lies behind also Romans chapter 13 and the fact that we should obey the governing authorities. Because basically, what the governing authorities, when they, they pass a law, now I know some of the laws, <laughs> and this, this emerges from California that's had some strange laws passed in the last 12 months, and I can now say that as a citizen of Idaho. Uh, <laughs> I'm not bound by some, except when I'm here. Uh, and, uh, uh, but nevertheless, we as Christians need to realize, okay, that, that the authority to issue those laws is only given to the government by God. And unless there's a direct, I mean, a direct attack against a biblical uh, uh, command, uh, then, then we're called as believers to obey. By the way, as Christians, I think our hardest time is driving. Uh, I was thinking about that yesterday when I saw the speed limit sign saying, well, I, I guess I better back off the accelerator a little bit because I just saw God's command that I'm to drive 40 miles an hour down the stretch of road, and I'm doing about 48. So, And you might say, well... Were you scared about the police? No, I'm scared about God. <laughs> you know, first and foremost, we fear God. God says, all right, you're to obey that. That's Romans 13. You're to obey the law. And that's the law. And that means backing up. And I don't care whether the person behind me starts honking because I'm going too slow. That's the law. So, by the way, I often say if, 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 you're, if you're a Christian and you're driving sanctified, you're truly sanctified. All right, <laughs> think, think that one through. All right. I, and particularly with men. I mean, that, this is where we have our challenge of sanctification. Um, <laughs> I believe God probably has uh, created uh, traffic jams on the freeway just to make sure we obey the speed limit. Uh, but... Uh, but I do like being in Idaho where I don't have to worry about traffic jams that much uh, anymore. So I do have to watch the accelerator a little bit. All right, well, that's, uh, that's a little bit of personal. That's more than implication. That's got an interpersonal application. Let's get back to the, the biblical text. All right, and so the, 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 the first four verses set the agenda for the first six chapters. And I should go back, the decree not only of Cyrus and Darius, uh, we see that, uh, but also in verse 14, and Artaxerxes. And I said Artaxerxes will the one who will be issuing the other uh, decrees as well. So, uh, so his decrees do tie in to God's work that he is accomplishing in and through the, the temple. But it begins with the decree of Cyrus, and as I said, decree understood that there is a decree that underlies what is in the first four verses, which, which is a proclamation. Now, at this point, we can leave this overall outline, and uh, what I have done is given you some expositions, and in fact, I, uh, 
I call, as you can see, the first uh, four verses the title of an exposition, the, uh, the powerful promise keeper. And uh, uh, certainly this is the way it's introduced, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. That, that this proclamation is a fulfillment of what God had already stated to be his will by the mouth of Jeremiah. He, he is acting in accordance with his word that has already been given. As I said yesterday, there is a, there is a debate on exactly what passage in uh, Jeremiah is being referred to. Uh, turn, if you will, to Jeremiah uh, chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. Beginning in verse 1, thus says the Lord. This is uh, going to be uh, Jeremiah's oracle uh, of, uh, of uh, judgment uh, continuing against uh, Babylon. And uh, the last two chapters of his oracles against the nations, and God has every right as the king over creation, over all of the earth, over all of the nations, to judge all nations, not just his personal people, the nation of Israel. But chapter uh, 51, verse 1, thus says Yahweh, Behold, I am going to arouse against Babylon. By the way, that's our verb. I'm going to stir up against Babylon. And against the inhabitants of Leb Kamit, the spirit of a destroyer. Right? He's going to stir up, he's going to arouse one against Babylon. And, uh, and who is uh, this, this uh, one that is going to come and uh, he's going to dispatch foreigners, he's going to it be with this uh, people that uh, they might bring Babylon to an end. Uh, verse 8, suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail over her, bring balm for her pain. Perhaps she will be healed. We applied the healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her and let each go to his own country. For her judgment has reached to heaven and the towers up to the very skies. He's talking about Babylon is going to come to an end. Babylon's power is going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed by this destroyer who I am going to arouse. I'm going to stir to be in opposition to Babylon to bring this to pass. And in fact, the Lord, verse 10, has brought about our vindication. Come, let us recount in Zion the work of the Lord our God. Now, this is going to create rejoicing among God's people because it's going to be the basis of the reestablishment of God's work among them. So, verse 11, sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. The Lord, that is Yahweh, has aroused the spirit of the kings of the Medes. Cyrus the Mede, because his purpose is against Babylon to destroy it, for it is the vengeance of the Lord, vengeance for his temple. Uh, why is Babylon going to be judged by the Lord? Because they are the ones, yes, under his sovereign plan and purpose, that was used as God's instrument of judgment against, Israel, against the Judah, against Jerusalem, against the temple. But as the latter prophets have already said, uh, they, they went about it with too much glee, too much brutality. They, they went beyond the bounds. And of course, they, uh, they destroyed the temple. And uh, so God is going to vindicate his, his people and is going to judge Babylon uh, because of their actions through 
these peoples led by a king whose spirit he's going to stir, arouse, and uh, this is going to bring vindication on account of, among other things, the temple. It's against that background, I think, with that echo, we come to Ezra chapter 1 to fulfill the word of Jeremiah. Who is the one the Lord aroused, stirred? To accomplish his judgment against Babylon, it was Cyrus. Now, the same king he stirred, he aroused to be against Babylon for its destruction, is then having conquered Babylon, the same king he now stirs to issue this proclamation that the people of Israel can return to Jerusalem and build the temple. Now, one of the things we now know is that uh, this was a basic, fundamental um, uh, thought as far as Cyrus was concerned. We have, in, when I'm in London, every once in a while I go to the British Museum, and I've seen on numbers of occasions the famous uh, you know, Cyrus uh, Cylinder which recounts another decree for another people to allow them to go back and, and reestablish their cults and, and their worship uh, because Cyrus took the ancient Near Eastern perspective that, that when he conquered peoples, their gods were affirming his right to rule, that he was a servant not only of his god Marduk, the personal god that, uh, that he worshipped, but that as he conquered peoples, their gods also were affirming him as, as king. And so he saw himself as representative of these gods. And to keep the gods' favors, this was, became his policy, he allowed the peoples that had been uprooted by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians to return back to their homelands to reestablish their worship centers, and by the way, as you do, realize I'm the benefactor, I'm the one that God has sent for you to be able to do this, and pray to your gods on my behalf for my continued blessing. And, uh, of course, it didn't help him when he finally got killed in battle, but, uh, but this was a whole concept. He wanted, he wanted all the gods of all the peoples to be on his side. Politicians haven't changed. All right, we, we, we want the support of all of uh, the people, and so the, uh, the proclamation. And, uh, and notice, he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. Not just to the Jewish exiles in Babylon. And there's a reason for this. Remember, the ten northern tribes have been defeated not by Babylon, but by Assyria. And uh, as opposed to the Babylonians, the Babylonians basically took the Judeans and allowed them to come to Babylon and basically reestablish themselves as a separate people in their midst. The Assyrians didn't have that policy. The Assyrians, when they took a people, what they would do, and you can read about in 2 Kings chapter 17, they would take the peoples and they would scatter them and make them intermarry with other peoples and bring other conquered peoples to the land and have them intermarry. What they were trying to do was break down national ideas. They were trying to destroy nations. At least the Babylonians, okay, you can't stay in your land anymore, particularly at the, the, the Judeans, because they were rebels. I mean, uh, remember Nebuchadnezzar gave him two chances. You know, he took, uh, uh, you know, he, he took a, a, a small group in 605 B.C. when he became king, having defeated the, the Assyrians and the uh, Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish, and, uh, and, and called for tribute, all right, taxation, and, uh, and took young men like Daniel to train them in the ways of the Chaldeans, Right, because obviously you wanted Chaldean influence, Babylonian influence in the, in the land. Uh, but just pay your taxes, and uh, what did Jehoiakim do? 
Didn't obey, so he's got to come back. Uh, 597, you know, take, uh, while well, Jehoiakim uh, dies, Jehoiachin, his son, is taken captive along with, again, many of the leading individuals. And once again, all right, you need to pay your taxes, stay in submission. You're my vassal. You are to be subject to me. Can you realize why the third time he had to come back, he said, enough is enough. And particularly because the Zedekiah and the Judeans held out for, you know, two and a half years with a siege. Actually appealed to Egypt to come help them. So for a time, Nebuchadnezzar has to deal with the Egyptians. You think he's a happy camper by the time he finally breaches the walls of Jerusalem? This is the third time. And even, and even when I was besieging you, you're still trying to get, you know, Egypt to come to your, you know, defense and, uh, and break the siege. And all the time you got Jeremiah, you know, with, in Jerusalem being called a traitor because he's telling the people what? Submit to the Babylonians. This is God's will. They didn't listen to him. They threw him in the pit. And, uh, and so you can somewhat realize why uh, they would... Uh, uh, they, they would, uh, uh, the Babylonians would, would take out, out, out their, their hostilities, their anger, as uh, they did against uh, Jerusalem and uh, the Jews. And yet still, having destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, still left a remnant in the land under a governor by the name of Gedaliah. And within a couple of years, if the Jews don't kill him, and then here for a fourth time, Nebuchadnezzar is on his way, so they hightail it down into Egypt. And you can read that, of course, in Jeremiah 41 through 44. I mean, how dastardly rebellious, you know, was, was this people. What got me on that? Well, obviously, uh, uh, the Babylonians destroyed the city, destroyed the temple. You, you can see some human reason why they would do that. But uh, particularly, we uh, see here that to fulfill the word, and yes, obviously, Jeremiah 25, 29 speak about the 70 years, but that's not what it seems to me Ezra's concentrating on. The narrator at this point, what's being concentrated on is, is it's, it's Cyrus that God has raised up to defeat the Babylonians for a further purpose of then allowing the people to go back and uh, rebuild the temple and ultimately the city, et cetera. Okay? Well, no, we don't. Okay, the uh, the oracles against the nations are not dated, okay. so we don't know. Okay. Um, so we don't know exactly, uh, you know, when. And a, a lot of Jeremiah, particularly from 21 on, is dated. Okay. I mean, the first 20 chapters aren't. Uh, we actually have to read and kind of get an idea. Now, that follows Isaiah. No, almost nothing is dated in Isaiah. Everything is dated in Ezekiel. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, almost nothing in Isaiah, everything in Ezekiel, and about half in Jeremiah. But the problem is, chapters 50 and 51 are not part of the half. The, in what year you know, did this take place? So, and to a certain extent, we don't need to know. This, this, and, and it could in the end, uh, because the, 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 the lengthy oracles of judgment are against Babylon longer than any other nation. And you can, you can realize why, uh, because of the Babylonian's impact upon the, uh, the Judeans. And... Um, and so Jeremiah does speak, having, as we might say, commended God's work through the Babylonians as judgment. Then he's also allowed by the Spirit of God to say, all right, and the Babylonians too are going to be judged by the same, by the same Yahweh. And uh, significantly, when you, you go into 46 to, uh, uh, to 49, there, there, there are statements of restoration of some of the nations, but not for Babylon. In other words, Babylon is going to be defeated, never to, never to arise with that kind of power again and as far as the ancient Near East is concerned. And it is true, Cyrus did not, did not uh, destroy Babylon in the way that uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, that uh, he dried up, as you remember, the canal the, of, uh, 
of uh, the Euphrates into, uh, into the city and came through basically the water channel and basically, you know, killed, killed the, uh, uh, the, uh, the leadership of Babylon and basically took the city over. And it was uh, centuries later when Babylon itself finally, uh, over time, uh, wasted away. Uh, so Babylon continued as administrative center of the Persian Empire. So Babylon, the city remained, but Babylon, the empire, was destroyed. And that's what we have in the first year of Cyrus, which is 538 B.C. To fulfill the word of the, mouth of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Babylon has been destroyed so that uh, uh, the vindication can come and Israel is going to be allowed to return and uh, build the, uh, build the uh, temple. So a proclamation was sent throughout his kingdom. Why throughout his kingdom? Because he not only took over Babylon and the environs of Babylon, he took over the complete Babylonian empire, which included Israelites outside of Babylon in northern Mesopotamia. So the proclamation went, throughout the empire because there were seed of Israel throughout his empire. Now, this means the proclamation took a while. Uh, don't get the idea, okay? He woke up one morning and said, okay, go, go down to the ter- town square in Babylon. In fact, we're going to find out in chapter 6, he wasn't even in Babylon, the city. He was in Ectabana, the, the, the summer residence, when he issued the decree. And so it, it took a while. I mean, yes, the proclamation was put down in writing in his first year, but it might have taken up to 12 months for that proclamation to get to all the nooks and crannies where Israelites were throughout the Persian Empire. And then they also got to uh, then uh, you know, make arrangements for those who are going to return back from, and the center of the return was Babylon, Verse 11 of chapter 1 to Jerusalem. Okay, went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. The, the major thrust is going to come from Babylon. That's where the, uh, the major response is, is going to be. And that means, obviously, we're dealing with, uh, uh, with the, the three tribes. Uh, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi are going to be the majority of those who go back. But that might come into the discrepancy of the numbers that we're going to talk about at the end of chapter 2, that it might be there were other Israelites from other tribes that joined as well because the proclamation was empire-wide. Now, the interesting thing is they would have to, they would have to join the caravan by leaving wherever they were in northern Mesopotamia, possibly coming down to Babylon, joining the caravan to go back, but not being part of uh, of Judah, Benjamin, or Levi, they're not a part of the, of, of the record given in Ezra chapter 2. But they were known because the chronicler has brought the, the genealogies of all 12 tribes down to the exile in Chronicles 1 to 8. And yet still, also in Chronicles 9, concentrates upon the, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Levi, because that's the predominant group that's going to go back, uh, because what land are they going to go back to? The tribal land of Judah, north of Judah, and Benjamin, as we talked about yesterday. And, of course, then, then the Levites lived among the people. All right, so uh, they're not going back to the northern kingdom, so even if you come from the north, you're still part of Judah, Yehud as it was known to the, to the Persians. So we're, we're to the proclamation. He sent a proclamation and put it in writing. And here's, here is the proclamation based upon the decree that is in chapter 6. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. This is what the messengers would herald. So people came together, this is what they would hear. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. So right away they, uh, they understand that uh, it is their king, the one who is in authority, an authority that he's going to say Yahweh has given to him, that uh, he is speaking. So they're hearing the word of Yahweh. 
I should probably say a word of Yahweh. The word of Yahweh is scripture, the word of God. They're hearing a word from Yahweh. This has Yahweh's authority behind it. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, Isaiah 41, and has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, Isaiah 44, 45. Whoever there is among you of all of his people, may his God be with him. Okay. So notice this is a proclamation directed toward Israel. You, his people. It's going to be important when we get to chapter 4. Cyrus's proclamation is for Israel, not non-Israelites. It is the Israelites. Let him, that is those from among his people, go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. We talked about that yesterday. This would uh, tie in to Cyrus's pagan understanding. Yeah, he's the particular God associated with, with uh, Jerusalem, although he has affirmed in verse 2 he's also the king over all. But uh, uh, particularly he is the God of the Israelites. Every survivor, verse 4, that is among the Israelites, at whatever place he may live or reside as an alien, by the way, it's very interesting to use the term here. An Israelite is to realize wherever they live within the empire, if it's not the land that God gave to them, they're an alien. An encouragement to go back to the land. Let the men of that place where they live support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle together with the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. That if an Israelite refuses to go back, personally, he is still to be invested in what is going to take place in Jerusalem. He needs to give silver and gold. He needs to give goods and cattle. And a free will offering for the house of God which is in Jerusalem. He is calling for, if I can put it this way, total commitment on the part of every Israelite to his proclamation that the temple in Jerusalem be rebuilt. If you don't go, you are to give. And it's very interesting at the end of chapter 2, yeah, we, we do find out that as the, as the Israelites uh, return, it is very interesting, verse uh, 69, according to their ability of chapter 2, they gave to the treasury for the work 61,000 gold drachmas, 5,000 silver minners, 100 priestly garments. And the question is, particularly when you get to uh, read Haggai, uh, that approximately 16 years after this took place, uh, the Jews in Judea were in abject poverty, of course, I, that guy brings that up, the fact they haven't done what they're supposed to be doing. They're trying to build their own houses and plant their own fields and, you know, famine and everything's going wrong, you know, more month than money. Yet it's very interesting, they were quite affluent when everything began. Well, when they came, they had also been invested with a lot of gifts from the people who did not come. It would be used in the, uh, the building of the temple. Uh, so here is, here is Osiris really saying, okay, build the house. That's the commission the Lord has given to me. And so here is his exhortation, his call, go up and build. And of course, go up is the same verb that's used in Exodus for leaving Egypt and going up ultimately in to the land of Canaan. And for those who don't go up to build, support those who do. So total involvement of all the people, and is to go 
to every Israelite in the, uh, the Persian Empire. Northern ten tribes as well. By the way, Chronicles 1 to 8, Luke chapter 2. Israel in around 500 to 400 B.C. knew where the descendants of all the tribes were. And by the time you get to Luke chapter 2, you have Anna, who was of the tribe of Asher. So people knew their tribal heritage. And even some in Jerusalem, Luke 2, at the time of Christ, knew that they were not of Judah or Benjamin or Levi. They knew what their tribal heritage was. So much for the ten lost tribes of Israel. Now, since A.D. 70, all genealogical records were lost in the temple destruction. No Jewish person today knows their tribal heritage. But Revelation chapter 7, God does. Because in the future, he's going to seal 144,000. You know, from uh, uh, 12,000 from each one of the tribes. He, he, knows, he knows every Jewish person and what their tribal heritage is. And... Uh, uh, so they're, they're not lost to God. Uh, but they can't say, no Jewish person can tell you today what, what, what their tribal heritage is. But uh, this was not true during the days of, of uh, Ezra. Nehemiah wasn't true during the time of uh, Zerubbabel. So there is, all right, God's faithfulness to his word. He has judged Babylon. And he has raised up Cyrus, and Cyrus has called upon Israel to be involved in rebuilding the temple. Many to go, and if you don't, you're still to give. There's the thrust of uh, Cyrus's proclamation based upon his decree. Now, of course, the question comes, where did Cyrus get these ideas? We talked about it yesterday, and I read the MacArthur study notes, so I'm on, I'm on firm ground to say the implication seems to be from Daniel. It's, uh, it's interesting, to, to, I think, two lines of evidence, and this is an implication, uh, you know, from, from Scripture. Uh, number one I brought out yesterday, and that is every decree that's going to be issued, chapter 6, Chapter 7 of Ezra, chapter 2 of, uh, of uh, uh, Nehemiah, positively, and even the negative ones, Ezra chapter 4, are all based upon some kind of information given to the king by, quote-unquote, loyal subjects, those who claim to be loyal subjects. In other words, the, the king basically issues decrees based upon information he receives and information that is tailored to also uh, chapter 4, aggrandize his person so that he would act in, in the proper way. So nowhere else in, in, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah does the Persian king act in an autonomous fashion. I think I should do this. He always responds to some kind of, of information that he receives and is called upon to act. That continues on also, obviously, historically. The same thing is true in the book of Esther that we talked about yesterday. And here is uh, Azure Harris, and he's responding to whoever is the lat latest one, you know, to get, uh, to get counsel, to get information, to get, to get exhortation to him. As I said, that's kind of a, a weakness, these, these great kings, and yet they're very, very open to this kind of uh, suggestion and, and, uh, and influence. They're not as strong as they seem on the outside. Uh, by the way, you didn't have to just read Hans Christian Andersen to realize the emperor has no clothes. Uh, the Bible makes that very, very clear. You know, yeah, okay, a man on the outside might look like he's strong and powerful, but before God, he's just, he's just a nobody. I wouldn't go quite as far as, uh, as, as Goswell when uh, Nehemiah calls Artaxerxes this man. 
because he calls him this man in prayer. He still honors the king, which we are to do, even New Testament believers. First Peter chapter 2 is still to honor the king. We ought to realize that the person we're honoring, though, is just a mere man. When we talk to God about the king, well, before God, he's just another man, this man. All right, so, uh, yes, I mean, if, if we're invited, and I, I have shake, shaken hands in there with a president or anything quite that big, but, you know, ambassadors and uh, senators, um, state senators, I mean, shake their hand. Yeah, you, you, you give them honor because of their position. But if I pray for them, they're just another man. There's nothing like special about them. You know, before God, the emperor has no clothes. Uh, so, um, uh, so there obviously is uh, yeah, another uh, implication. So here, here is Cyrus. He issues the, uh, the decree. Now, uh, just in the uh, few minutes we have uh, left in, in this uh, segment, obviously from 1.5 to 2.70, I, I call it an exposition going home because that's exactly what these uh, Israelites were doing. They were going back to their home country. They were going home uh, to do what they had been commanded by Cyrus to do, which is uh, to rebuild the, uh, the temple. So what do we have? We have in verses 5 and 6, we have a summary of the response to the proclamation. In verse 5, this is the response that we've already read of Israelites. Uh, that is, those who God aroused, the Spirit of God stirred, they went up and rebuilt the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And obviously how that is going to take place is going to be recorded through this uh, narrative section through chapter 6. And then verse 6, all those around them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, with valuables, aside from all that was given as a free will offering. And here, the exact echo of what had been said in verse 4. Now, verse 4 makes it clear this is to, okay, the proclamation was for Israel. Verse 6, all those about them. Implication seems to me now it goes broader. Not only the fellow Israelites who do not go also give to the returnees, but so do other Gentiles encourage them as well. And here's an echo back to Exodus chapter 12, because with the original Exodus, what did those Egyptians among whom Israel, not, not all of them, but there were others who encouraged them by giving them goods and gifts. <laughs> uh, basically, they'd, they'd worked for so long for free, it's like they were getting all their past due wages. All right. But here again is along with, okay, go up, okay, the king issuing a decree, go up, echo of Pharaoh, go up, get out of the land. Go back to where God, you know, well, want, He wants you to worship. Yeah, go and leave and worship, and being encouraged by others as they leave, even non-Jews. A further echo, patenting, you know, going back to uh, uh, to Torah. So as I put it here, the returnees, neighbors, encouraged by giving different articles and offerings, and not just their, uh, not just their. Their uh, Jewish neighbors, but their Gentile neighbors as well. Including among those uh, uh, Gentiles, Cyrus himself. Verse 7. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. Even Cyrus, you know, gave, and he gave these temple utensils that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had taken. He brought them out by the hand of uh, Midradath, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Shezbazah, the prince of Judah. 
I'll say at this point, I believe that uh, Shez Baza is Cyrus's political appointee. All right, that as they go back, Yehud is going to be his own province, uh, part of a bigger, say, well, not say trap at this point, ultimately will be a say trap beyond the river. And uh, so this is, if we might put this way, the official uh, prince, governor of, uh, of uh, the, the people under Cyrus. He's, he's a Cyrus is official representative. Now, the unofficial leader is going to be Zerubbabel, who by 520 is going to be the official governor. How that all takes place, the text doesn't tell us. So I don't see Shez Baza and Zerubbabel as being one and the same person, basically because uh, both have Babylonian names. So you can't say that uh, this is a, a, another name, that there was a Jewish name and a Babylonian name for uh, for uh, uh, Zerubbabel on the, on the same understanding as Daniel and his three friends who had uh, Jewish names, Daniel 1, and were given, uh, uh, given Babylonian names at uh, the end of chapter 1. Of course, uh, the three friends are known by that name in, uh, in their names in chapter 4, the Babylonian names. So uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as uh, we know them. But uh, so the dual names, as the idea you have a Jewish name, you have a, have a Babylonian name. Well, that's not true here because we don't have a Jewish name. Both names are non-Jewish. So it seems like we're dealing with two distinct uh, people. And we might put it this way, that says Baza is the official king, and Zerubbabel, this point, is the unofficial leader. He's the one recognized by the Jewish people. And no indication they didn't act in concert. You know, it's, it's not that there was any kind of uh, a dispute between the two. It's just, uh, and when you get to chapter 5, that's why the elves are going to go back and say, well, Cyrus and the, the prince who came, the one he sent, was Shezbazza. So now Zerubbabel, by that point, was the, uh, was the governor. And so we have, uh, we have the vessels listed. And even at the end of uh, chapter 1, all the articles of gold and silver, 5,400. But if you add up uh, what is, uh, what is uh, given in verses 9 and 10, it's just a little over 2,000. I mean, how would you get to 5,400? Well, I think what you have is the significant vessels are given, but when all the articles of gold and silver, they number far more than the specific vessels given by Cyrus uh, to, uh, uh, to the prince. And so Shezbazah bought them, these vessels, all with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. And uh, then in chapter 2, and uh, just in about uh, five minutes, uh, after the uh, after the the vessels after the, after the physical objects. In chapter 2, we have most importantly the people. These are the people who return. Well, we do know this. The Ark of the Covenant is never mentioned after the destruction of the temple. So... Uh, Hollywood's come up with a number of ideas of what might have happened to us. Uh, and uh, none of it is biblical. The, an the ultimate answer is we don't know. Um, because of the sacred nature, uh, and, and Jewish tradition says it was uh, destroyed so that it was not captured. Uh, because you've got to realize in the Jewish mind it's like Capturing the Ark of the Covenant is like capturing God. This represents his presence. And, uh, and even the, uh, the disobedient, abominable Jews, Israelites of Jeremiah's day, were not that blasphemous to think, that, okay, we, we can allow that which represents the very person of God to be taken captive. Uh, also a tradition that it's been buried and is going to be dug up you know, become part of a future temple. Uh, my understanding today is that uh, there is a renegade group in 
Israel is already, you know, prepared, you know, vessels for the rebuilding of the temple when it takes place. And there's a, a uh, I have going to be a rebuilt, you know, Ark of the Covenant because they don't know where the original Ark is or, again, the major tradition has been destroyed. All we can answer biblically is we don't know. But there is no indication, no record, obviously, in Ezra and Nehemiah that the, that the, the, the second temple had the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, same thing about Josephus. By the way, Josephus also affirmed that that, uh, that uh, Daniel is the one who who informed and encouraged uh, Cyrus to issue this decree and uh, gave the wording. So I don't know whether Josephus' support is valuable or not uh, because uh, he also incorporated some pretty um, bizarre things in his history of the Jewish people. Uh, that are not necessarily uh, uh, biblical, <coughs> it, like making Rahab of Joshua too an innkeeper instead of a prostitute. Um, so uh, you can't trust everything that uh, that uh, Josephus says. I mean, he's he's bringing up uh, you know Jewish tradition and his own interpretation of that tradition. He's uh, not always uh, biblical and accurate. He was a propagandist. He's trying to put the best light upon Judaism to his uh, Roman overlords. Uh, but, uh, but it's interesting he does say that. He says the same thing about uh, the priest running down the, the, the hill from Jerusalem. Al- Alexander the Great took it and, you know, with uh, the scroll of uh, Daniel saying, we've been expecting you. You, 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 know, you, <laughs> you know, you, you've been already predicted to come and, you know, the Greeks defeating the, per- the, uh, the Persian Empire. And, now, we do know that Alexander did grant special religious privileges to Israel, to, to, to the Jews in Jerusalem. But whether that was based upon Josephus' story or not, that's, you know, we don't know. So, Josephus, uh, you read him with a grain of a suspicion. Um, so, that's why I, I support it basically on, on how the... Persian kings were influenced and also canonical connection that Ezra Nehemiah comes right after Daniel in the, in the Jewish canon. But uh, that's why it makes most sense, I think. Implication-wise, but not, uh, not because of Josephus. In fact, there's almost a sense I wish Josephus would have said the exact opposite because that would more confirm it. But, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, we'll leave it at that. Now, without going through all of uh, the names we um, we can break it down. You can see the breakdown that I've given to you here. Uh, the leaders, uh, these came with Zerubbabel. Notice Zerubbabel is first in verse 2. Uh, he is going to become the recognized leader, lay leader, uh, who by 520 will also be the governor. Though nothing is made of his Davidic ancestry in this book, this narrative. We only know that through the genealogy of Chronicles and uh, the book of Haggai and Zechariah. And follow him is Jeshua, who, of course, we're going to find out in chapter 3 was the high priest. And so we have both uh, lay and uh, priestly leaders that, uh, that are, but uh, there are 11 men. A 12th one is added in uh, Nehemiah uh, chapter 7. And, of course, uh, 12 probably might have been the original number one dropped out. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't know. It could have been textual. Or, uh, and, and we do have to realize some came later and might have been incorporated in. There, there was flux between, you know, people coming and going in the, uh, in the, uh, the years, the almost 80 years between Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 7 that might also deal with the fluctuation, although most, see, numbers are the, the hardest part of the, the, uh, the uh, text to transmit, and so uh, 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 textual variants among numbers are, are, are well known as far as the Old Testament text is concerned. And as I, as I then you know, bring out, we have the, the non-priest, the lay people from from 2b, the number of the men of the people of Israel, that uh, seem to be defined first by family, and then by the time we get to verse 21 and on, 
even though it's still sons of, now we, we're looking at geographical locations. So they're either listed by their family heritage or where they came from. Now remember what I said about the second name yesterday? You know, that in the ancient world, your second name either was your father's name or the place from which you came. You're either Jesus, son of Joseph, or Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus from Nazareth. It right, continues on in the New Testament era. It's interesting, among the lay people, we have both. We have some that are, that are noted by their family heritage and some that are noted by the places from which they came. Why the distinction? Don't know. I'm just, I'm just pointing out my observations. By the way, like all of you, I always have more observations than I have answers. Uh, but you'll never get answers if you don't observe and put it down. But uh, I don't know why, why the distinction, but it's there very definitely. And ties in, obviously, to custom. Then we have the priests and uh, the Levite singers and sons of the gatekeepers, those who ministered in the, the temple with the priests. And, of course, you notice that uh, we have a multiplicity of priests in verses 36 to 39 compared to the number of Levites and singers and gatekeepers in verses 40 to 42. We have more chiefs than Indians. We have more leaders than helpers. That's going to become an issue again in chapter 8 with Ezra. Okay, I got priests that are coming back and lay people. I don't have Levites. And, uh, and Levites were very, very important. They're the helpers. Obviously, the priests can only do as much as the help they receive from the official helpers. And not just anybody can help at the temple. They also have to be from the tri tribe of Levi. Uh, so that becomes very important, and Ezra, of course, knows that. And so we'll see that uh, tomorrow in Ezra chapter 8. He will stop and actually recruit Levites to go back with him. What's the use of having priests come and, and meeting a multiplicity of priests in Jerusalem and not having enough helpers? Temple servants, sons of Solomon's servants, those with unconfirmed status, if they could not prove their genealogical heritage, particularly those who administer in the temple, they were not allowed to do so. Now, there is no, uh, it talks about the Urim and the, uh, the Thuman in verse 63. There's, there's no evidence that uh, they still had the Urim and Thuman, only that uh, they would have to wait until a priest could ascertain uh, through him and from the, the will of God concerning these people. And then the total is given, and once again, the total uh, of, uh, of uh, 42,360 is, again, about 12,000 plus too high compared to the numbers given. And I think the best solution is that there might have been those who came from the northern kingdom as well that are not part of this, of this record because it uh, definitely goes back to 1-5, the, those from Judah, Benjamin, the priests, and Levites. Those are the ones who particularly are emphasized, but uh, there, were, there were probably others from the other ten tribes that went and returned as well. And uh, at the end, they offer offerings for the temple restoration, and they begin to settle in their cities. And you have to realize they go back to a, basically a desolate country, and those who did live within the borders basically were non-Israelites at this point. Remember, those that had been left by and large had gone down to Egypt. So uh, th there might have been a few Judeans left that didn't to go with the, uh, the renegades down to Egypt. But by and large, the people that they would meet in the land, within those boundaries, would be non-Israelites. And, of course, most of the land was desolate, according to Ezekiel chapter 33. Uh, and uh, uh, so they, 
they, they come back to nothing. You got to realize they, they return to build the temple, but there's no hotels, there's no houses, there's no fields with crops. I mean, they go back to nothing. And uh, so they do. They go and lived in their cities, and all Israel was in its cities because they need to reestablish themselves in the land. And uh, so we need to realize the hardship they were under. It wasn't just a, a matter of get on with building the temple. You've got to get on with reconstituting basically a nation, a community, you know, made up of cities, fields, and households, and uh, uh, reestablishing as it were, a, a community identity in the, the province of Yehud. And of course, Cyrus hadn't said anything about that. And even with the, the gifts that he gave, they all had to do with the temple. So uh, you, can, you can realize how the resources might have been depleted very quickly as... Uh, close to, uh, to, you know, to 50,000 people, well, 42,300. And that, and, and besides male and female servants, you number 7,000. I mean, yeah, the, the total amount was over 50,000. Uh, can, can you realize 50,000 people going base, basically back to a desolate land? How are they going to survive? So uh, the, the text really doesn't get into that because it's going to concentrate on why they went back, which was to build the temple. But uh, kind of think in terms of the hardships they face uh, to accomplish God's plan and God's purpose. Well, those are the first, uh, first two chapters. And I'll uh, uh, go back up again to our overall uh, uh, outline. And uh, what we have uh, uh, seen, let's get back to where we were. Uh, we have uh, uh, seen so far, obviously, the, the, dec the decree, and, uh, and in the first uh, two chapters, we have seen the response and the people returning to the land. And in chapter 3, we have a pattern now developing of decree, obedience, and their obedience will continue on in chapter 3. And uh, we'll look at chapter 3 and then chapter 4 in our next segment. And chapter 4 is where the opposition begins, which was going to stop the building of the temple. Now, let me just say a word about chronology. I inferred it, so let me now be explicit. The decree is issued in the summer of 538 B.C. That is the first year of, of Cyrus. As I said, that proclamation throughout the country took months so, in other words, they didn't return back in 538 B.C. The earliest anyone posits is 537 B.C. You have to have time for the decree of the proclamation to be heard, responded to, and then the returnees gathering together in Babylon and 50,000 people, you know, getting ready to, to move. Now, Ezra's group, a little under 2,000, took four months I don't think 50,000 people move quite that quickly. So you're probably going from early spring, from the, about the middle of March, and uh, they probably didn't even get back to the land. We, we know they're, by chapter 3, in the land by the seventh month of whatever year they return. But at uh, most, uh, conservative would be 530 7 B.C. for their return. Could have been even up to two years, 536 B.C. Now remember Jeremiah's 70 years began in 605 B.C., the 70th year that Jeremiah predicted would be 536 to 35 B.C. It's very possible they did return back to the land in 536, that is the 70th year after Jeremiah's proclamation of 70 years. So I know I've, I've read a couple of commentators last night saying, well, the 70 years was figurative. 
Now, I'm not so sure that that wasn't literal. And, uh, and I think we can understand the implications chronologically. And uh, like I said, the earliest anybody possibly getting back is 537, which is the 69th year after Jeremiah's prophecy from the first deportation. Uh, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, very, and, and uh, Wickham uh, deals with this in his uh, commentary and uh, the uh, Wycliffe Bible commentary, uh, that he posits when you really think in terms of all that was involved here in getting the proclamation of the people and the people's response and getting prepared to move in this large of a caravan uh, back to, to Yehud, we're probably looking at 536 B.C. by the time they get back. And I think he's got a good argument there, implication-wise. But can't be dogmatic because the implications of the text not in the text itself. It doesn't tell us the seventh month of what year when you get to 3-1. All right, well, it is uh, 9.32 by the clock, so let's go till uh, 9.47. Almost a plane. It's too bad it wasn't 7. 47, but uh, 947, we'll uh, return and take a look at chapters 3 and 4.